بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Continuing with our journey through the book Umda Al-Fiqh of the great Imam Ibn Qudam Al-Maqdasi Rahmatullah Alayhi We've reached the point where the author he now says Al-Sharat Al-Thalith He's talking about the third condition that we need to observe before we go ahead and we pray So he says Sitr Al-Awra He says Sitr Al-Awra which is covering the Awra this word sitr, if it's mentioned with the fatha, it means the action, the verb, the taghtiyah that we do. And if it's mentioned with the kasra, as it is in the text, sitr, it's the item that you are using to cover your aura. What is this word aura? Aura is the word which has linguistically the meaning of that which is to be embarrassed from. So that which you should have shyness from and embarrassment from with regards to your body. The technical meaning the meaning in the Sharia, the meaning that we are concerned with in the study of Islamic jurisprudence, fiqh, is ma yajbu satruhum fi salah, is that which is obligatory to cover whilst you are praying, aw ma yahrum another ilayhi fil jumla, or that which is forbidden to look at in general for a person other than yourself. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran in Surah Al A'raf, Ya bani Adam, khudu zinatakum in the kulli masjid, O children of Adam, Take your adornment, take your zina, meaning cover yourselves at the time of every prayer, at every masjid. Masjid here means in this verse, the time of prayer when you are praying. So it's imperative that we remind ourselves that not only should we cover our aura, not, which we're going to discuss what is the aura for men, what is the aura for women, we're going to discuss that in a few moments, but we should also bring to mind that when we're standing in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the one that we venerate, the one that we love, we should make an effort to wear the best of clothing if possible. We should make an effort to be in a situation that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would be pleased with. It's like you're going to meet somebody that you really care about, somebody that you really hold in high esteem. You're not just going to turn up in your pajamas or whatever else that people chill out in. You're going to try to put on the best of clothing, try to put on the best of appearances. So likewise, when we pray to Allah Azza wa Jal, we want to put on our nice perfumes, our nice smells, atars, put on the nice clothing, and ensure that our teeth are clean. We've used the miswak if able to do so. And just in general, try to have a pleasant appearance in this great act of worship, which is to pray before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the author, he's talking about the covering of the aura. He says, bima la yasifu al-bashara, that the aura has to be covered with clothing that doesn't describe the skin, meaning that the, the clothing that we use for covering the aura, it shouldn't be so thin that the skin can be seen through that clothing. If that's the case, then it means you haven't covered your aura. With regards to clothing that is tight, tightness of clothing should be avoided. However, it doesn't invalidate the salah because it's something which is very difficult to avoid. For example, no matter how loose your clothing is, when you go into the ruku or you go into the sujood, your the clothing is going to gather around your aura, it's going to be tight. So the ulama, they say that this tightness of the clothing, which is unintentional, it doesn't affect your salah. طيب. The author, he says, وَعَوْرَةُ رَجُلِي وَالْأَمَةِ مَا بَيْنَ سُرَّةِ وَالرُّكْبَى The aura, that which needs to be covered in the salah for the man and for the amma. The amma is the female slave is that which is between the navel and that which is between the knee. So the navel and the knee are not aura for these two people. However, the ulama are not saying to us that after having defined for us what is aura between the navel and the knee, the belly button and the knee, they're not saying to us that you can go ahead and dress like that or pray in that manner. What they're saying is that the strict definition is this, but you should of course, as we mentioned before, go above and beyond that. Even in Muslim societies, you find that generally the men, they dress and cover themselves to the best of their abilities. They don't try to resemble the fools of society, like the rap artists and the other uh, ones who have strange fashion. Rather, they try to dress in an honorable manner. And this is how the Muslims are supposed to be, even outside of the Salah, cover themselves in an honorable, honorable manner. Uh, so we mentioned that the Amma is the female slave. And a quick side point, Islam doesn't encourage slavery. In no place in the Quran and the Sunnah do you find that Islam encourages slavery, rather you find that Islam encourages the freeing of the slaves. And Islam inherited slavery historically. So it came with lots of rulings and regulations to deal with that situation 
that Islam found itself in. The author, he says, That the free woman, all of her is aura in the salah, except for her face and her hands. All of the woman has to be covered from head to toe, except for her face and her hands. Uh, the Prophet Sallallahu said in the hadith, which is collected by Imam uh, Abi Dawood and Imam Tirmidhi, may Allah have mercy upon them. The Prophet Sallallahu said, لا يقبل الله لا يقبل الله صلاة حائد إلا بخمار. That Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is not going to accept the prayer of the hair. Hair here means the one who's balig, the one who has reached the age of puberty. Allah is not going to accept her salah unless she is wearing the khimar, that which is covering the head. So, in the salah. We said that the woman, she has to cover the whole of her body except for her face and her hands. The official opinion amongst the Hanbali scholars in the madhab is that the hands also have to be covered. So they differ with our Imam. The Imam says that the hands don't have to be covered, but the official opinion amongst the Hanbali scholars in the madhab is that the hands also have to be covered. And also a point to mention is that the aura in the salah is different to the aura outside of the salah. So many of the scholars, they mention the outside of the salah you have to, the woman, she has to cover her face. Uh, and even in the salah, if there are men around her, that she is not related to a janib. The author, he said, The Umm al-Walad is a type of slave woman that is, um, she has given birth to, her, to a child for her slave master. And the slave master is going to free her or she will be freed by his death. This is the Umm al-Walad. Al-Mu'taq ba'duha, the Mu'taq ba'duha is a, a slave woman that has been owned by two masters and she has been freed by one of them. So she is partially freed. So these two, they are similar to the one that we mentioned before. They are similar to the slave woman. The awra is between the belly button and the knee. The author, he says, وَمَنْ صَلَّ فِي ثَوْبٍ مَغْصُوبٍ if a person finds themselves in a situation where they are praying in a stolen clothing, in a stolen thobe, or in a land or a house or a property which is stolen, then these people in this situation, their prayer is not going to be valid. Their prayer is not going to be valid. Why? Because the humble scholars, they use the rule in fiqh, that every uh, thing which is forbidden, it then causes the act of worship to be forbidden. So if you do something uh, which is connected to the act of worship, which is here discussing covering the awrah, if you do this in a haram way, it means that your prayer is going to be invalid. So anything which is done haram connected to an act of worship, it causes the act of worship to be invalid. Why? Because they say, nahi yaqtadi al-fasad, that the, the thing which is forbidden, if it's done, it then leads to the act of worship being invalidated. The author he says, وَلُبْسُ الْحَرِيرُ وَالْذَهَبُ مُبَاحٌ لِلنِّسَاءِ دُونَ الرِّجَالِ That the wearing of silk and gold is permitted for women but not for men. إِلَّا إِنْ الْحَاجَةِ Except and unless there is a need for the men to wear the gold, to have gold or to have the silk. لِقَوْلِ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهِ وسلم, Because the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said in the hadith collected by Imam Ibn Majah and Imam Nisa'i, may Allah have mercy upon them, the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم held up uh, gold in one hand and he held up silk in the other hand and he said that these two are forbidden for, for the male the males in my ummah in my nation but permissible for the females in my nation so silk and gold is something which is impermissible for men but it's permissible for women pertaining to this point natural silk is allowed to wear in a situation where somebody has, where, where the man has some type of skin disease and nothing else can bring relief, no other material will bring relief except for natural silk. So in this situation, the person will be allowed to wear it. Also, if the person, the man finds himself in a situation where he's got no other clothing to cover his awrah, then he can wear the natural silk and there's no need to repeat the salah thereafter. Manufactured silk, the the one which is manufactured is permissible in all situations for the male. Regarding the point of gold for women, now if a woman was to wear gold in the prayer, 
whether it's gold jewelry or it's uh, gold which is sewn into the clothing, then the ulama they put a qaid, they put a restriction. It is, has to be ma jarat bihi al ahada, that which is customarily worn in the local customs of that people. So the person shouldn't be going beyond uh, what is the customary, cust customarily norm of her people in wearing gold, whether that be in the salah or outside of the salah. And definitely the woman wearing the gold shouldn't be imitating those who are of no religion or those who are of uh, you know, foolish behavior in society. The author he says, وَمَنْ صَلَّ مِنَ الرِّجَالِ فِي الثَّوْبٍ وَاحِدٍ بَعْضُهُ عَلَىٰ آتِقِهِ أَجْزَأَهُ ذَلِكَ Whoever from amongst the men prays in one piece of clothing, okay, some of it is upon his atiq, then that will be sufficient for him, that will suffice him, that will be valid. The atiq is that which is between the shoulder and the neck. So if a person is wearing one piece of clothing, as long as it has something going around one of the shoulders, between the shoulder and the neck, one side of the body, then that would be valid and sufficient. Why? Because the Prophet ﷺ said in the hadith, which is collected in Sahih al-Jamia of, of Shaykh al-Albani, rahmatullah the Prophet ﷺ said, لا يصلي أحدكم في الثوب, في الثوب الواحد في الثوب الواحد ليس على عاتقه منه شيء that none of you, O men, should pray in one thobe uh, that has nothing going around the neck from it. The reason uh, this ruling is given the ulama they say is because this will prevent the thobe from falling the clothing from falling and exposing the person's aura exposing the person's private area because if it doesn't have something which is connecting to this part between the shoulder and the neck it's likely or it's possible that the thobe can drop down and expose the person's aura in the salah which would then cause it to be invalid so this ruling is there for that reason and this ruling is for the fard salah only with regards to the optional salawat, the nafal salawat, those salawat which are not fard, which are not obligatory, then the person can pray in one piece of clothing. The man, male, can pray in one piece of clothing, um, even if it doesn't have something which is between the shoulder and the neck. Taib, with regards to a clothing, if person, a man or woman, is praying and the aura accidentally becomes uncovered for whatever reason, if the aura is accidentally uncovered and it's a lot, it's what is known as fuhush. And this fuhush, which is a lot of the aura is uncovered, it's determined not by the sharia, but it's determined by the person themselves. Okay? The regulation of what is fuhush, what is a lot of, ex of, of the aura being exposed, is determined by the person themselves. So if the aura is accidentally, accidentally exposed and it's a lot for a long time, for a long period of time, then this is going to now cause the Salah to be void and invalidated. They have to repeat the Salah. However, if this uncovering of the Aura is done on purpose, then any amount of uncovering makes the Salah invalid. And this is something that men especially have to be very careful of. We see it so many times in the Masjid that people wear strange types of clothing and when they go into the Raku or the Sujood, half of their private parts from behind are being uncovered and it's something which has to be rectified and they should avoid doing so. The author, may Allah have mercy upon him, he said, فَإِن لَمْ يَجِدْ إِلَّا مَا يَسْتَرُ عَوْرَتَهُ If a person finds themselves in a situation where they cannot find enough clothing, except for that which is going to cover their aura, meaning that it could be that the man, he doesn't have enough clothing except to cover from the belly button to the knee, سَتَرَهَا Then this is what must be covered. فَإِن لَمْ يَكْفِي جَمِيعَهَا سَتَرَ الْفَرْجَيْنِ And if it's the case that the whole of the aura is not going to be covered, then what should be covered with the clothing that is available are the two private parts. Because they are, in, they are the most in need of being covered. He says, فَإِن لَمْ يَكْفِيهِمَا سَتْرَ أَحَدُهُمَا If it's a situation where the person doesn't even have enough clothing to cover both of his private uh, parts, front or back, and sadly you find this uh, in many situations of people that are imprisoned unjustly, may Allah free the Muslim prisoners that are imprisoned unjustly, they, they can find themselves in such a situation or people who are very poor. So if somebody doesn't have enough clothing to cover both of the private parts, then he should cover one of them. And the position in the madhab is that the dubr, that the, 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 the bottom, the backside should be covered because it is afhash. It is more, um, more in need of being covered. 
فإن عدم الستر بكل حال and if covering is not available clothing is not available at all صلى جالسا يومئ برقوة سجود then the person would pray sitting down and they would um, they would gesture with their heads when they want to go into ruku or sujood. So as they're sitting down with their legs crossed or their legs together um, in the normal tashahud position, they would gesture with their head for the ruku, bringing the head lower for the ruku and bring it even lower for the sujood. When salla qa'im al jaz, and if they were to pray standing, it's permissible, it doesn't invalidate the salah. So the author is saying if the person doesn't have any clothing, then it's recommended for them to pray sitting down. And they will gesture with the, for the ruku with their head by bringing it lower and with the sujood even lower with their head. And if they do choose to pray standing, then it's permissible. And obviously the reason you pray sitting down if you are in that situation that you don't have clothing is because it's, it, it will cover you more than it would if you were standing. But if the person is alone, then some of the ulama, they said it's permissible to pray standing because that is the, that is the, uh, the original ruling. طيب. If somebody finds themselves in a situation where they don't have clothing, they don't have to go around and ask the neighbors or ask people to lend them clothing. Because this is something which is known as minna. Minna is when you are asking people to do a favor for you and this is something which is madmum. It's something which is disliked in Islam. Okay? And therefore the person doesn't have to do that even though it's something to cover their awrah for the salah. They don't have to ask people to lend them clothing. However, if somebody offers them clothing without them having asked and it would help them cover their awrah, then it's obligatory upon them in this situation to take that clothing. Why? Because the rule in fiqh is مَا لَا يَتِمُّ الْوَاجِبِ إِلَّا بِهِ فَهُوَ الْوَاجِبِ That, that by which the obligation is not completed except with it, then that thing becomes obligatory in of itself. So in this situation, the obli obligation is to cover the awrah and clothing is now available and the awrah will not be covered except with this clothing. So it's obligatory to accept that clothing. The author, he said, وَمَنْ لَمْ يَجِدْ إِلَّا ثَوْبًا نَجِسًا if a person finds themselves in a situation where they don't have any clothing except clothing which is najis, which is impure due to having impurities on it. Oh, makan najisan, or they find themselves in a place where there is impurities. Salla uh, fihima, then in that situation the person goes ahead and prays, whether it be in the impure clothing or in the place which is impure. Wala i'adata alayhi, and the person doesn't have to repeat the salah thereafter. However, in the madhab, and the reason for this opinion is Because Allah says, Fear Allah as much as you are able to do so. So in this situation when a person cannot find except for impure clothing, or cannot find a place to pray except for a place which has impurities on the floor, then this is the best of their ability. And Allah says in the Quran, Fear Allah as much as you are able to do so. That you can only do that which is in your control. So, um, they go ahead and they pray and they don't have to repeat the prayer thereafter. However, the official opinion in the madhab amongst the humbly scholars, if that they find, if that a clean thobe is found in the time of the prayer after you have prayed and it still remains within the time for that prayer, then you must go ahead and repeat it. طيب. The author, he moves on now and he says, The fourth condition. The fourth condition, The fourth condition is that the person must have purity from impurities, from the najasat in his body or her body, in the clothing, the thobe, and mawdi salati, and in the place of praying. So in Bukhari and Muslim, there's a hadith narrated by Ibn Abbas where he mentioned that the Prophet وسلم, فقال إنهما لا يعذبان وما يعذبان في الكبير بل إنه كبير. That the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم passed by two graves, and he exclaimed to the companions that verily these two in these graves are being punished, and it's not for something which is big, meaning that they could have avoided this punishment, but in terms of its result, it's very big because now they're being punished. فأما أحدهما فكان لا يستتر من البول وأما الآخر فكان يمشي بالنميمة. As for one of them in the grave, they never used to protect themselves from urine drops. 
And as for the other, they used to walk around town spreading gossip. So these two, they were causes for the people to be punished in their grave. And of course, if, if something which is going to cause you to be punished in the grave, then it's something which you have to avoid. So for us, regarding our topic, the najasa, the urine drops, is najasa, it's impurity. So this is a proof for what the author is saying, that the impurities have to be avoided, whether it's in your body, whether it's in your clothing, whether it's in the place. They related to this, if a person is carrying impurity, it's not valid for them to pray whilst they're carrying that impurity. What is an example of this? Say, for example, somebody is going to visit the doctor and to give in a urine sample or to give in a blood sample. So they have it in one of the tubes, but they decide that they go to pray before they meet the doctor. So they put it in their pocket. So in this situation, the person is carrying impurity. So it's not allowed for them to pray. Their prayer would be invalid. Or it could be that somebody is carrying a baby and the baby has a soiled nappy. So that soiled nappy is impure. And due to that impurity, the salah is not going to be valid. With regards to the purification of the clothing, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَالثِّيَابَكَ فَطَّهِرُ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Madathir tells the Prophet sallallahu and the believers at large that they must purify their clothing. So this has the meaning of purifying your clothing and a secondary meaning and an important meaning is to purify yourself from polytheism, purify yourself from shirk. With regards to purifying the place, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran in Surah Al-Baqarah, وَعَهِدْنَا إِلَّا إِبْرَاهِيمَ وَإِسْمَاعِيلَ أَنْ طَهِرَ بَيْتِهَا أَنْ طَهِرَ بَيْتِي لِلْطَائِفِينَ وَالْعَاكِفِينَ وَرُكَّعِ السُّجُودِ uh, we we uh, made it incumbent upon Ibrahim السلام, and Ismail السلام, that they should purify the Kaaba and the sanctuary for those who are making tawaf and for those who are making itikaf and those who are bowing and prostrating therein. So the place itself where the worship is taking place has to be pure based upon this ayah in Surah Al Baqarah. طيب, related to this issue of the place and the purity. If a place has najasa, right, there's impurities on the floor, and that's the only place that you can pray in. However, if you have a thick mat, which is not going to soak up the najasa, maybe it's a plastic mat, it's okay for you to then place that plastic mat over the impurity, okay, and go ahead and pray, and that's not disliked for you. If a person is in a situation, another situation, another scenario, they're in a place, for example, maybe they're imprisoned, may Allah protect the Muslims. They're in a place which is impure and they don't have a mat to cover that impurity. Not like the first situation that we mentioned that they have a mat. In this situation, it's just them and the impurity on the earth. If the impurity is dry, then it's permissible for them to prostrate on it because it's dry and it's not going to transfer to their clothing or to their body. However, if the impurity is wet, then they shouldn't prostrate on that impurity, rather they should come as close as possible to it without touching it. The author, he moves on and he says, Overlooked an exception from the previous rules that we've mentioned about having to avoid the impurities is, the author, he says, except for the impurity which is overlooked, like a little bit of blood and that which is similar to it and that which is similar to a little bit of blood in ruling is like a little bit of pus or a little bit of vomit so this is overlooked uh, in terms of um, having to avoid it if it's a little bit of blood or if it's a little bit of vomit or a little bit of uh, pus then this is overlooked also in the Hanbali school of thought the Hanbali scholars they say that flowing blood which is going to be a lot of course because it's flowing, maybe it's from a wound or something of that nature, then this is also overlooked due to mushaqqa, due to it being difficult to deal with that situation, so the person can go ahead and pray in the situation of having flowing blood. The author, he said, وَإِن صَلَّى وَعَلَيْهِ نَجَاسَ لَمْ يَكُنْ عَلِمَ بِهَا If the person prays a prayer, right? If the person prays the prayer and they had impurity upon them but they didn't know that they had this impurity on their clothing or on the body or a second scenario or the person did know 
the person did realize that they had impurity on the body or on the clothing but then they forgot about it then the prayer of these two situations is going to be valid so if a person prays with impurity on the body or impurity of the clothing either they didn't know about it at all or they did know about it but then they forgot then the salah is still going to be valid why? because based upon one of the evidences for example Imam al-Hakim he narrates in the Mustadrak uh, that the Prophet وسلم, one time was praying and he took off his shoes whilst he was praying so the companions who were behind him the Sahaba they also took off their shoes in following the Prophet وسلم, because that's, that's how they were whatever the Prophet did they would follow without question and they would question later so after the prayer they asked the Prophet وسلم, oh Prophet of Allah we saw you take off your shoes in the prayer why did you do this the Prophet وسلم, said أتاني جبريل فأخبرني أن فيه ما قدر that Jibreel alayhi salam came to me the angel Gabriel came to me and notified me that on my sandals there was impurity فألقيتهما. so I removed the sandals in the prayer فإذا جاء أحدكم إلى المسجد فلينظر إلى عليه so if one of you comes to the masjid then he should look to his sandals فإن رأى فيه ما قدر and then if he finds in them some impurity فيهما, then he should remove that impurity from the sandals and go ahead and pray in them so here we find that the Prophet وسلم, he removed the impurity from his sandals and how is this a hadith a proof for what the author is saying the author is saying that if you happen to pray and you didn't know about the impurity or you forgot about the impurity that was on you then your prayer is valid why is this a proof because in the hadith the prophet وسلم, didn't repeat his, repeat the prayer he continued with the prayer why because the prophet وسلم, didn't know about it in the early part of the prayer so the fact that the prophet وسلم, didn't know about it this allowed for the prayer to be valid and it didn't make it invalid طيب. and the ulama they mention a rule in fiqh النسيان والجهل يجعلان موجودا معدوما that forgetfulness and not having the knowledge makes a matter which is present as though it's not present okay forgetfulness and not having knowledge about an issue makes the matter which is present as though it's not present ولا يجعلان معدوما موجودا and it doesn't make the thing which is absent present so the first part of the definition is the important part for us that النسيان والجهل يجعلان موجودا معدوما that forgetfulness and ignorance of a ruling makes a matter which is present as though it is not present so in this situation the person who didn't know about the impurity it's as though the impurity wasn't there in ruling for this person however the famous opinion amongst the later Hanbali scholars is if the person was in, was in the first situation which is that they knew about the impurity but later on they forgot then this person must repeat the prayer okay why because in because the person knew about the impurity so the ruling of having to remove it fell upon this person as opposed to the situation where the person didn't know about it at all until the prayer had finished so this person is exempt totally that's just extra information inshallah and remember what I'm do as I said many times with regards to the extra information if it's too much for you it's okay you can leave it to the side the important thing for the beginners taking this course is that they totally understand what the author is saying and above and beyond that they don't have to understand it if they can well and good alhamdulillah Alhamdulillah, you have the recordings, you can also go back and review them. The author, he says, may Allah have mercy upon him, when alima biha fi azalaha wa bana ala salatihi. If a person in the situation where they come to know that there is impurity on them in the salah, maybe somebody mentioned it to them, that hey, you're praying and you have impurity on your clothing, then the person has to remove that impurity and the salah will continue. The salah is not rendered void as long as this doesn't take a lot of movement if it takes a lot of movement for the person to remove this impurity and a lot of time then in this situation the person will have to repeat the prayer from the beginning the author he says that all of the earth that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created 
is considered a place of worship, it's considered a masjid and the salah is valid in it, in all of the earth. Because the Prophet said in Bukhari al-Muslim, جُعِلَتْ لِي الْأَرْضِ مَسْجِدًا وَتَغُورًا فَأَيُّمَا رَجُلٍ مِنْ أُمَّةِ أَدْرَكَتُ الصَّلَاةَ فَيُصَلِّي That the earth has been made for me a place of prostration, a place of worship, the Prophet is saying. And it's been made for me, the earth, a form of purification. So any person from my ummah that the salah comes upon them, wherever they are, they should go ahead and pray. So this is the foundational rule that the whole of the earth is pure and it's a place where we can pray and it's something that we can use for purification. And now the author is going to mention exceptions from this rule. So he says, إِلَّا الْمَقْبَرَةَ Except for the grave. إِلَّا الْمَقْبَرَةَ And the maqbara can be said with a dhamma or a kasra. So you can say al-maqbura or you can say al-maqbira except for the graveyard. Why? Because the Prophet ﷺ said in the hadith in Sahih Muslim collected by Imam Muslim لا تصلوا إلى القبور ولا تجلسوا عليها. Don't pray towards graves and don't sit upon them. And also the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم mentioned in the hadith in Bukhari and Muslim لعن لعن الله اليهود والنصارى اتخذوا قبور أنبيائهم مساجدا. That Allah سبحانه وتعالى cursed those Jews and those Christians who took their the graves of their prophets as places of worship. So to pray towards the graves is something which is forbidden and the place is considered a graveyard if it has three or more graves and if it doesn't have three or more, more graves then it's not considered a graveyard yet you shouldn't pray close to the grave another exception from the earth being a general ruling where we can pray is the hammam the hammam is not the toilet the place where you relieve yourself the hammam uh, in classical arabic is the place where people go for bathing a place which is designated for bathing. So this place is not allowed for you to pray in these places with a, a place of bathing. Why? Because people have their aura showing there generally. The aura of people are generally showing there. Uh, and also the Prophet ﷺ said in the hadith collected by Imam Tirmidhi, Al-Ardu kulluha masjid illa al-hamam wal maqbara That the earth, all of it is a masjid, a place of prayer, except for the hamam the bathing areas and except for the maqbara, except for the grave. And also the author now mentions al-hawsh, the hawsh which is the place where you relieve yourself. If there's a place which is designated as a place where you relieve yourself or people relieve themselves therein, then this cannot be used for prayer obviously because there's najasa there, there's impurity and the shayateen, they gather in those places. So one cannot uh, pray in those places. A rule to mention, uh, which is appropriate here, a rule of fiqh, that the ulama they said, Al-Hawa ya'khud hukm al-qarar. Al-Hawa ya'khud hukm al-qarar. That the air, or that which is above, takes the ruling of that which is below. So if you find a building which is solely designated to be used as a bathroom, one goes to relieve themselves there, then a person cannot now pray on top of that building. Why? Because what is above takes the ruling of that which is below. Likewise, uh, an example of this would be uh, if a person is making etikaf, a person is make, doing the act of worship where they, um, they, they have to stay in the masjid during Ramadan, for example, the last ten, last 10 nights. However, if the person went above, outside above the masjid, then that person is still considered to be an etikaf because what is above takes the ruling of what is below. So in the example that I gave of forbiddance, if the building is a place where you relieve yourself and it's only been built for that purpose, then you cannot pray on top of that because above takes the ruling of that which is below. However, if there is another building that has a separate purpose to the bathroom which is below it, then you are allowed to pray on top of that second building. Okay? The author, he also mentions, may Allah have mercy upon him, as an exception from the rule of the earth being a place of prayer, Wa'atan al ibl the stables, or the, what's it called, stable or pen, the stable of camels. Because Jabir ibn Sumrah radiallahu anhu narrates that a man came to the Prophet sallallahu and he asked him, Usalli fi mirabid al ghanam Ya Rasulullah, he said, can I pray in the, uh, in the sheep pens, where the sheep and the lamb are kept? The Prophet sallallahu said, yes. Then the same man, he said, Usalli fi mubarik al ibl can I pray in the place where the camels are kept? The Prophet ﷺ said, La, no. 
Imam Ibn Taymiyyah, rahmatullah alayhi, Shaykh al-Islam Ibn Taymiyyah, the great scholar Ibn Taymiyyah, he gave some wisdoms why this may be the case, apart from the fact that the Prophet sallallahu uh, explicitly said, no, that you cannot pray in the uh, places where the camels sleep or the, the camels are kept. He said one of the reasons is because they are created, the camels are created from jinn, okay? And they're always angry and they're always trying to run away. Thus, when you are in prostration, they may harm you as though they are, uh, when they're trying to run away. Sheikh Mutlaq Jasr, he mentions an important point that when the ulama, they give you these wisdoms, it's not a hadith, it's not an evidence from the Quran or Sunnah, it's not an evidence from Qiyas, analogy, it's not a linguistic evidence, it's just a wisdom that they have derived from uh, the sources of Islam. He says, al hikam tashum wa la tudhaq. He says the wisdoms, you can take them like, like as though you are smelling a flower, meaning that you benefit from it, or it, as though you're smelling something which is nice. You benefit from it, wa la tudhaq, but you don't taste it, meaning you don't ingest it as a ruling. You don't base your rulings upon these wisdoms, but they are wisdoms that you can benefit from in terms of passing. The author, he said, Ashatul Khamis, he moves on to the sixth condition. He says, Istiqbalul Qibla, facing the Qibla. This is a condition for the prayer to be valid. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, in Surah Al-Baqarah, فَوَلِّي وَجْهَكَ شَطَ الْمَسْجِدِ الْحَرَامِ وَحَيْثُ مَا كُنْتُمْ فَوَلُّوا وَجُوهَكُمْ شَطْرَهُمْ Face, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and O believers, towards the Masjid al-Haram, towards the Kaaba. And wherever you may be, then put your faces towards that direction when you are praying. The author, he says, إِلَّا فِي النَّافِلَةِ عَلَى رَاحِلَةِ لِلْمُسَافِرِ This is not a condition except for in the obligatory prayers. Because the author, he says, except for the one, uh, sorry, an exception from this obligation of having to face the Qibla in the Salah, is the one who is making a nafil prayer, the one who is making a supererogatory prayer whilst on a riding beast and whilst traveling. So verily this person prays in the direction that they are moving. Why? Because in the hadith of Sahih Muslim collected by Imam Muslim um, from the companion Ibn Umar عنهما, he said أن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم كان يصلي سبحته حيث توجهت به ناقته that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم used to pray his supererogatory prayers on his camel wherever the camel would be going in whatever direction the camel would be going and Ibn Umar he said elsewhere that this was the reason for the revelation of the verse in Surah Al-Baqarah فأينما تولوا فثم وجه الله wherever you face then there you will find the face of Allah سبحانه وتعالى meaning that it's valid for you to pray in any direction in the situation that the author is describing, which is that it's a supererogatory prayer, that you're upon a riding beast, and that you are uh, traveling. So, in this situation, the author is saying that you can make the takbirat al-haram in any direction. However, the mutaakhirin and all of the scholars in general, they say that you should face the qibla if you are able to do so. And the mutaakhirin, the later Hanbali scholars, they say that it's wajib, it's obligatory for you to first turn towards the Qibla, make the takbir, and then you can carry on praying in the direction that you are traveling. The author, he says, وَالْعَاجِزُوا عَنِ الْإِسْتِقْبَالِ The one who is unable to face the Qibla لِخَوْفٍ due to fear أو غيره or other than fear فَيُصَلِّ كَيْفَ مَا أَمْكَنَهُ So then this person, if he's being chased by uh, criminals or he's in war, or he's a prisoner that is tied to other than that direction of the Qibla, then in this situation the person goes ahead and prays in any situation and there's in any direction and he doesn't have to repeat. And other than this situation of not being able to face the Qibla uh, because, because that's been forced upon you, uh, then you have to pray facing the Qibla directly. And if the person is close to the Kaaba, then they must face the Kaaba as though there is a straight line between him and the Kaaba, meaning directly face the Kaaba. And if the person is in Mecca, then the person has to face towards the sanctuary, meaning face as close as possible towards the Haram. Okay, if they're in Mecca. And if they are in the Arabian Peninsula, then they face towards Mecca. If they are anywhere else in the world, then they face towards what the author is going to say now. وَإِن كَانَ بَعِيدًا فَإِلَى جِهَتِهَا and if the person is far away in another country, then towards the direction of Mecca. 
because the Prophet said in the hadith in Tirmidhi, ma bayn al mashriqi wal maghribi qibla. That which is between the east and the west is qibla for you, meaning when you are far away from Mecca in another land. Tawthi he says, wa in khufiyat alayhi al qibla fil hadr, sa'ala wa stadalla bi maharib al muslimin. That if a person is in a Muslim land and he's unable to determine for himself where the qibla is, then what he should do, he should go to the masajid and find out by uh, looking at that place where the Imam enters to pray. Or he should go ahead and ask the Muslims that are in that town uh, where the Qibla is. فَإِنْ أَخْطَعَ فَعَلَيْهِ الْإِعَادَةِ However, if the person prays without having done this and he tries to come to a conclusion of where the Qibla was, but then he found himself to have made a mistake later on, then this person has to repeat because he didn't make the effort which was required, required upon him. The author, he says, If the person is in travel, in a situation of travel, and the Qibla is hidden from him, he doesn't know which direction the Qibla is, then in this situation, the person tries his best, if he knows how to determine where the Qibla is through the stars or other means, uh, then this person uh, goes ahead and prays, and if he was found to be wrong, in his determination, then he doesn't have to repeat the salah because he did the best of his ability. And if two people who are able to determine, determine the direction of the Qibla, they have the knowledge of how to determine where the Qibla is, but they both differ. One is saying it's in the east, or the other one is saying it's in the west. Then neither of them should follow the other. Why? Because facing the Qibla is a shart, is a condition. And praying in jama'ah, praying in congregation is a wajib, is an obligation. So the shart takes precedence over the obligation, which is to pray together in jama'ah. Because both of them are different. One is saying, no, you're wrong. The other was saying, no, I'm right. And they both have the ability to determine which direction the qibla is in. So in this situation, they don't pray together. They pray separately. طيب. Uh, the author he says and if there's a situation in this journey where a person is either blind or he's ignorant of the rulings of how to find out where the Qibla is and these two people that know how to find where the Qibla are differing in this situation the one who is blind or ignorant he chooses either one of them to follow that he feels that he can trust more so he looks, for example, to their religiosity, that I, I feel that this person is very religious and he has knowledge and trustworthy, and I know him to be an honest person, then I'm going to follow this person. So that's what the person does in this situation. Muhammad We'll stop there, inshallah, because we've taken a lot. We've got one more condition to go. We'll do that next week and continue with the rest of the book. With Allah's permission, anything which was correct was from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mistakes and uh, shortcomings were from myself and shaitan. And uh, I'll go ahead and answer your questions now, inshallah.